Good morning, everybody. Now we are going to, going to start a session on National Symposium Pediatric Ophthalmology, a cutting edge technology in pediatric ophthalmology. I invite our chairpersons and co chairpersons, Dr. Sumita Agarkar, Dr. Jaspreet, Shivangi Bhave. Parikshit Gokte, Urmila Chawra, please occupy the dais. Moderator Rushikesh Mai, Urmila Chawla, Jitendra Jithalan, Jithani. Like to <laughs> Dr. Kalpada Narendran can start her topic on. First is Pradeep Sharma. Okay. No Can problem. you open? Dr. Kalpana Narendra, she doesn't need any yes. Thank you. introduction. Is one of the legend in pediatric ophthalmology, subspecialty, and amblyopia. I don't want this. I can just give me the slideshow, regular slideshow. Okay, thank you. No, no, this one. Uh, uh oh. Okay, fine. Uh, Thank you, uh, sir, for the opportunity to be here uh, in this uh, National Symposium of Pediatric Ophthalmology. So my talk will be on recent developments in uh, pediatric cataract surgery. So uh, as we all know that pediatric cataract is the most common treatable problem in children. And though there is so much of advances in the, uh, you know, the neonatal and the prenatal uh, you know, uh, advancements in, in trying to find out the, uh, you know, the abnormalities in the baby. Still, we see a lot of children born with uh, congenital cataract. And uh, as we all know that this presence of cataract disrupts the uh, development of visual pathways in these children. And if not treated at the earlier age, it can lead to uh, stimulus deprivation amblyopia and also retards the normal growth of the eye or the emetropization. And a lot of advances have gone into the uh, management of pediatric cataract as well as in the, uh, in the diagnosis part. Because initially when a child is diagnosed with cataract, one thing you will ask is family history, whether the parents are you know, um, having cataract or is there a consanguineous marriage or a rubella infection. But uh, not much of probing went into the, uh, the genetic analysis because we did not have a uh, you know, lot of options and it was found to be very exp expensive and not expertise available uh, all over the parts of the uh, country. But now uh, we know that 50% of the congenital cataracts are due to genetic abnormalities and mostly autosomal dominant inheritance. But these recent uh, technology, which is called the next generation sequencing, is definitely uh, a good tool to at least counsel the parents. What is the possibility of the next child developing a cataract? Or what is the reason for the cataract in this particular child? Is there any genetic uh, abnormality or any mutation which has led to it? And the cost is only about 14,000 rupees. So now this is definitely an option which we can give it to the parents um, uh, to at least to find out the cause uh, underlying reason why this uh, cataract is there. 
The second thing is the timing of surgery. If these children are not uh, treated at the right time, it, it, it can sometimes lead them to be blind uh, in all their lifetime. So the age at surgery is the main determinant of the visual outcome. So unilateral cataract, we operate even at the age of two weeks to four weeks because uh, we have good backup with the anesthesiologist and then we have good equipments to operate on these small eyes and bilateral cataract usually six to eight weeks. And uh, the, the next question is uh, when to uh, put an intraocular lens. Again, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, it, different thoughts and different groups, but uh, we have implanted an eye oil in an ophthalmologist child in a three weeks of age in a unilateral cataract. So it can be done if the corneal diameter is more than 10 millimeters, there's no other pathology. It's a good eye, you can definitely implant an eye oil in a uni unilateral cataract even at the age of three weeks. And coming to the IOL power calculation, we do not know, I mean, all of us know very well that we don't have a customized IOL formula for children. We are using the Hagis formula, which is more accurate and shorter eyes. And SRKT is the formula which I've been using all while. But now we have found out and studies also have uh, shown, especially the Savlin Kao group uh, from the, uh, with, and, and, and Professor Jagatram group, they have come out saying that Baddest to universal formula is, which is very extensively used in adults, have found to be promising in the pediatric age group as well. But then we do not have long-term outcomes, but we in Coimbatore Aravind, we've been doing it for the past two years and we've uh, seen very good results with the Baddest to universal formula. Again, this is just to you know show you there's another study which was done in San Francisco. They also uh, operated on 64 eyes of 64 patients between the age group of one and a half to 15 and a half. And they have proved that it is a reliable formula. And coming to the choice of eye oil, we all know that monofocal intraocular lens is the choice of uh, uh, eye oil for children. And uh, preferably a three-piece uh, monofocal acrylic in the uh, younger age group, usually less than five or six years of age. And uh, what about these premium IOLs, the so-called the multifocal, the toric, and the EDOF lenses? Do they have a role in children? Yes, of course. In older children, and uh, we have also done, you know, some patients, and they've been uh, proving that it is a good, uh, effective uh, approach in older children. And coming to the positioning IOL, the preferred position is in the bag. But then, uh, you know, sometimes uh, we do a lot of secondary IOLs where in, uh, in the sulcus, uh, present uh, placement also is preferred, but in the sulcus, always go in for a three piece IOL. And uh, iris claw also has been time tested, good results with iris claw as well. You can either do a, a posterior enclave or anterior enclave. A good iris claw lens like that with the peripheral iridotomy has proven very well. And uh, it's especially in the African countries, you know, you don't have to do PPC, you don't have to do membranectomy, and definitely a good option. Yes, scleral fixated also is an option in older children uh, for secondary oil implantation if there's no good PC support. And uh, then the bag of the lens, the Mary Tassignon's uh, lens, which is popular in Belgium, and posterior optic capture is also a good option. But preoperatively, for the evaluation, we have good diagnostic tools. I'm not going to the details of OCT because the surgeon is already going to speak about it. But that definitely gives you a good idea whether the, your, your posterior capsule integrity especially for secondary implantation or, or in patients where there is a pre-existing posterior capsular dehiscence, it, it allows you to prepare in case you need additional retina support or, or a vitrectomy machine, and so on and so forth. And just to show you a technique, the, the technique is so advanced now, use the FACO machine, and in children usually above the age of two, we do a clear corneal incision, and uh, you do a good rexus. We have a good microscope set up now and using the FACO IA, you know, this whole surgery can be done and completed in, in seven, eight minutes. And uh, once you just extend the incision, a three-piece lens in the bag, and a primary posterior capsulotomy, again with the cystitome, and then complete the posterior capsular rexus, and do an anterior vitrectomy, and uh, the wound is closed with the 10 0 suture, which you do not have to remove. If it is, sometimes what happens is there's some deposits in that and the child is it get some irritation or it might form an idus for infection, then you go ahead and remove it. And intraoperatively, the advances are, you can give intracameral antibiotics, so the incidence of endothelmitis is very less in children. 
Midriatics can be used and steroid depot injections for patients with poor compliance or delayed children. Multifocal requirements, yes, you have precise, you need it to in older children, precise biometric measurements and uh, always aim at hyperopia. I'm not going to this video because it's already uh, short of time. I think I have only one more minute to go. So this is also an option and, uh, but older children, precise biometry measurements should be there and you have to be technically comfortable. So this is a multifocal IOL. Torix in children also do have a role, uh, especially in older children, more than two diopters of stigmatism. You can definitely plan a toric eye oil, which will correct them for distance and uh, uh, and and have to counsel the parents regarding uh, glasses for near vision. And again, this is a child with the toric eye oil. I'm using the Varion guided system for the marking and also for the centration of the rexus. So this is a good option. I'm not going to the detail. This is the optic capture, which is uh, we all know that long way back uh, gimbal popularized this technique. Definitely is a good option even now in certain high myopic patients where you can't do a vitrectomy, you can uh, do an optic capture. So that is a good option for children with high myopia. You can see in this, I normally put the lens and do the PPC. But here for the optic capture, you do the posterior capsorexis and then place the lens, but you have to be very gentle. Extend the wound so that you don't have any, give any pressure to the eyeball so that the vitreous will not come out. So you can see very gently pushing the haptics into the bag and uh, trying to, after this, you will try to push the optic into the anterior vitreous space. Should be done very gently, just, just take one, one more second. So this is the uh, optic capture technique. So you can see now, I'll demonstrate, that's the, uh, the posterior capsule and that's the anterior capsule. It's a good technique. We were not doing it in between. This video, just to show you the persistent pupillary membrane. Can you just run the video? It's not working. You blocked it. Super, boys. I want to show off. Please open it. <laughs> no, this is no, no, sir. Oh, OK, anyways, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> so. And coming to the, uh, the you know, the follow-up is very important. The rehabilitation is very important in the, uh, you know, so this future data, this data is an interesting thing which follow in uh, Africa because uh, it's very difficult for follow-up there. So they have this dashboard system where it, which gives all the details. So definitely it can be a good way to track these patients who undergone surgery for the follow-up. And again, all this, I'm not going to the detail. So future trends, we're looking at customized IOL formula for children customize IOLs for children, and then different strategies to prevent PCO, and the other, you know, tests, and, and more importantly, the intrauterine detection for, uh, you know, diagnosing cataract at earlier age. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, sir. Thank you. Any questions to Dr. Kalpana? No, Dr. Jaspreet, uh, kindly give uh, one brief comment. I mean, uh, it, it, was, it was very well covered, uh, no doubt. Uh, the first point, like uh, the genetic analysis, uh, the more you get it done, probably the etiology would change because earlier we used to say it's idiopathic, idiopathic. But very important is you have to examine the family members. You can have opacities in, in them which are peripheral, which are not cause of concern and they have never been bothered about. So it's very important to examine the family members because we are seeing now that a familial cataract is becoming you can say common because we were not examining the parents earlier so that is one thing the other thing is uh, the formulas are fairly because obviously these are all adult formula incorporate for children so unless we have a very definite answer for that probably one's experience in our experience srkt works fairly good then uh, the other thing is uh, the posterior optic capture the important thing here is inject viscoelastic in the burger space before doing a capsular access because that's the most important thing. Otherwise, you, there are chances that you will have vitreous tags in these. And uh, no doubt, I mean, the I am doing posterior optic capture for the younger children because of uh, maybe lesser chances of a visual access obscuration as it seals the back. In older children, the, am the amblogenic, it's not that amblogenic if you do a five or six year old, so probably you can plan your surgery accordingly. And yes, indications are there where you don't want to touch the vitreous. The important thing is also to like, inject viscoelastic in the burger space. Thank you. 
So now I invite uh, Professor Pradeep Sharma sir. Uh, Dr. Pradeep Sharma sir uh, needs no introduction. He will be speaking on update on management of childhood nystagmus. Dr. Sharma sir. And Dr. Pandey, you will be the next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Subhash. I would like to at the outset thank the organizers and the chairman scientific committee and for this opportunity given to me. So I'll be talking on the update on the managing of childhood nystagmus. As you all know, nystagmus is a rhythmic regular oscillation of the eyes. It may consist of alternating phases of a slow drift in one direction with a corrective quick jerk in the opposite direction, or it may be a sinusoidal to and fro movement on either side. As we classify them, we usually do it in a more clinical form. The physiologic ones like OK and caloric or the end gaze nystagmus, the pathologic ones as the sensory associated with poor vision, which may be having underlying retinal or neurological problems, or the motor which have uh, neurologic disorders, and the childhood nystagmus, which may be considered as essential infantile nystagmus. And there are some nystagmoid conditions, which are not true nystagmus. So these physiologic nystagmus, all of you may be aware as the railroad nystagmus, the optokinetic nystagmus, which are used for testing, especially in a comatose patient, you may use the caloric test or the adult eye phenomenon. The nystagmoid movements usually puzzle us in the form of Heyman bilchowskis phenomenon, or in the perinodes, you may have a convergence retraction nystagmus. Uh, the acquired asymmetric vertical or oscillopsia present nystagmus needs imaging. Now, this is something which is underlying. The details of these may be in different forms that you may have acquired nystagmus. These are there, you may keep in mind. So, these are having underlying neurological lesions and that's why imaging is essential whenever you have. So, whenever a child presents with an acquired condition or an asymmetric nystagmus like this child has an asymmetric nystagmus. So, when it came to us, we got an imaging done and we found a lobulated supracellular enhancing mass lesion which was there. So, this can be life saving if you keep this in mind. Uh, otherwise, the nystagmus in childhood, you will have to see whether they are having associated poor vision. And if that is there, a complete eye examination, a fundus examination, and if necessary, electroretinography should be done. Those cases which have none of these usually are earlier known as congenital nystagmus or motor nystagmus. Nowadays, we use the term infantile nystagmus syndrome. There is another condition which we'll deal with, that is a fusional maldevelopment nystagmus syndrome. In the older books, it was manifest latent nystagmus. And the third variety is the nystagmus blockage syndrome in this category. Those which are marked in red, again, are to be kept in mind, spasmus newton syndrome, seesaw nystagmus, vertical nystagmus and acquired asymmetric as we talked about earlier. All of these you have to do neuroimaging. Now this condition in which there is a to and fro movement on either side, if you record them, they will be like this pendular uh, jerk, nyst pendular nystagmus. And usually they have associated problems in the retina. So look into it and do necessary ERG or VER to confirm that. Those cases in which there is no such thing, usually the visual equity is going to be good. And as you find this child, this is having a infantile nystagmus syndrome. It starts as a triangular jerk, to and fro movement, which are there in the early uh, infancy. And later part of infancy, it becomes formalized in the form of a pendular and then a jerk nystagmus. Usually, they will acquire a head posture. And that is a very important thing. If you notice it, then you can correct it accordingly. Now, this child is coming with a head posture. He has a right-sided AHP, and as you can see, there is a fixation of the eye of the right eye. Now, how do you confirm that? If you cover the right eye, he continues to have the left eye in abduction fixating. Now, this is important to distinguish from an adduction null. This is a gaze null. And this is usually of the infantile nystagmus syndrome. Now, see this another child who has again a similar uh, right sided fixation turn. And when I cover it the right eye, he is going to first initially the nystagmus worsens and then it again assumes the left adduction position. Now, this is important to clinically differentiate because these cases are manifest latent nystagmus and usually the surgery in these cases is bimedial fadden. Now, another adult person who is having a fusional maldevelopment nystagmus associated with intermittent divergent squint. Now, when the IDS is latent, there is a phoric form, then there is no nystagmus. And when I break this 
as you see now the ideas has broken it becomes manifest the nystagmus also gets manifest so here the key thing is if the strabismus is corrected these cases can be converted to latent form so uh, shianxia syndrome or infantile esotropia nystagmus in abduction cases they they will usually have a face turned to either side whichever is the eye in adduction and if that is there if you are planning a surgery always do an mr recession with a posterior fixation in order to correct the head posture along with the squint that's what has happened in the second video you can see the head is straight as well as the eyes are straight spasmus newtons you have to keep in mind now these children usually have a head nodding torticollis and also an asymmetric nystagmus now you see the left eye is having a larger abduction and frequency now if this is noticed by you you should always do an imaging so don't miss ever a child having a spasmus newtons 80% of them will be benign but you would not know which are the other 20% which may have a problem in the form of chiasmal glioma like this child who has a chiasmal glioma presenting with that nystagmus blockage syndrome is another situation in which the eyes are straight when the nystagmus is there and when the eyes assume an esotropia the nystagmus gets controlled so you have to correct the squint in these cases and that nystagmus also can be corrected so examination just to remember head posture for distance and near look for associated squint and any associated albinism is there in these cases so this is what you have to keep in mind now measurement should be done for the head posture to find out how much surgery is to be done sometime children would have a changing head posture or periodic alternating nystagmus you need to examine them for at least 5 minutes in order to check for this pan if you miss it you will have problems in the non surgical management you have to do optimal prescription of glasses prisms are usually very limited role auditory biofeedback and acupuncture we have tried as research work but they are only for uh, short term goals medical treatment in the form of baclofen gabapentin and even benzolamide eye drops have been tried but they are having a limited role at present so surgery we have the options of correcting the head posture by shifting the eyes to the primary position and you can have this surgery usually done around 4 years of age and we prefer the anderson uh, augmented anderson's procedure which is mr recession 9 and lr recession 12 like this child as you see pre op his head posture and after the surgery it's got corrected as also the eng electronystagmography will show you correction if you have missed a pan you will usually have a face turn converted to the other side on the other day and you would have to do uh, augmented endoscence of the opposite two muscles so that's another advantage of doing augmented endoscence that you would still have an option of correcting the pan if there is an associated squint correct it and that will help similarly in the same principle the chin up down or the torticollis are also corrected and nystagmus surgery in the form of four muscle recessions have also been used but they have limited role of 3 months and the nystagmus usually turns back even artificial divergence surgery has been tried by people but i would say that they have a limited role so the take home points are optimal correction cases with definite eccentric null up to 30 degrees respond very well to augmented endoscence for more than 40 degrees do resections cases with pan bilateral augmented endoscence cases with fusional mal development nystagmus do a squint correction the iena shanshia as i said would require mr recession with posterior fixation and cases with no definite null you need we don't have actually a good answer all these things have been tried but not much, much, much not much use imaging has to be done in spasmus newtons vertical seesaw and acquired nystagmus so with this i would like to thank you all for a patient listening thanks excellent uh, presentation sir if anybody is having any question you can go ahead just and i would like to invite uh, sir use the Dr. mic please Pramod i think everybody Pandey will be before please give him a mic huh? yeah pandey dr pandey is here ha uh, sir what was your question do you find uh, any vestibular labyrinthine cause of uh, nystagmus liver study vestibular labyrinthine vestibular labyrinthine lesions yeah so they are coming in the form of acquired nystagmus usually and they will have a linear relationship of the uh, soft the uh, slow velocity usually and if they have i mean this sort of thing you would have to do uh, either an ent consultation 
they may require treatment medically or sometimes surgical management. The other one is, did you find any congenital or idiopathic? Uh, congenital, uh, usually we are uh, not getting any uh, such things. Usually they are having a neurological acquired condition, sir. Thank you. Sir. So just one thing I yes, wanted thank to you, sir. ask is no. how do you decide whether to do an Anderson or the Kestenbaum's procedure? So as I said, for up to 30 degrees of a face turn, I would do an augmented Andersons. That means 9 millimeters of medial rectus and uh, 12 millimeters of lateral rectus. I wouldn't do a Keston bomb for up to 30 degrees. If there is more than uh, 40 degrees, then I would do uh, the same Andersons plus resections. The, uh, as I said, the reason is that if you have missed a pan and you have done augmented Andersons, you can easily do the other two muscles. But if you have done a Keston bomb, there will be a problem. You would have to undo the resections and then do a recession. So it's a complicated procedure. I watch just one one question, sir. Yeah. Without uh, the VNG, is it possible to differentiate a saccadic intrusion with the nystagmus, like a pendular nystagmus, versus a square wave jerk? When you see the patient, I mean, just a subtle clinically. Yeah. So without ENG, yes, you may clinically see that these are going to be irregular. Whenever there are saccadic intrusions, there will be an irregularity which will come. A smooth nystagmus will be a regular uh, movement. So. Clinically, you can feel that, but yeah, to have an academic thing, you have to do a recording and not only just recording, then a, a, a NAFX or nystagmus equity functions and all these elaborate things. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Suvash, I would like to thank the organizers and uh, uh, AIOC for this opportunity. I would be talking about uh, concepts in evolution, pre-myopia and uh, CCDDs. Now, as we all know, we came from marine life where visibility was very poor, light was very low. We had short range of vision. We needed more of olfaction and less of vision. Now, something happened. We came out on the terrestrial life and then we became arboreal. More light, more long range, long range vision. So with that, what we got ingrained is that the corneal power had to decrease. Lens, which was spherical, became elliptical. And the axial length had to increase by three times. What we were used to in the marine life, when we came out, the axial length had to increase to give effect to long range vision. And that ingrained thing for the change in the axial length we still have, and this is what is probably causing more and more of myopia. So there is a, myopia is a global challenge, incidence is, uh, and prevalence is rising uh, exponentially as we all know. By 2050, almost half of the world population is uh, projected to be myopic. And prevalence of high myopia is also projected to rise very exponentially to about 10%, which is a major uh, uh, load on the blindness. And we are on the cusp of a myopia epidemic. Now, myopia leads to pre-myopia and pre-myopia leads to emetropization. So what is, I may classify pre-myopia as effective state of point, uh, plus 0.75 to minus 0.5. And with other uh, risk factors like uh, sufficient uh, likelihood, which can give rise to future development of myopia, like close work, less outdoor activities, and if they are parents who are myopic. Now, when to intervene in these cases is an important uh, matter. Now, emetropization, as we were talking, that we came from the ocean, so this is a very important aspect we have to understand that the visual signals relating to retinal defocus are, are there for both myopic and hyperopic. They regulate the eye growth. So identifying components of these pathways offers novel therapeutic opportunities. There is afferent arm, which is in the peripheral retina, which we use for DIMS and all those uh, uh, devices. The efferent arm is poorly understood. Atropin affects eye growth through muscarinic, non-muscarinic uh, uh, actions. And retinal dopamine, retinoic acid, and nitric oxide are likely involved. So dopamine is a very important component in this with melatonin and dopamine, they are related. And pineal gland is also related to that extent, we can say. Now, dopamine is important neurotransmitter in the retina, modulates neurogenesis, visual signaling, and emetropization. Close relationship between light exposure and dopamine release. Inverse relationship between outdoor activities and myopia. Retina has high levels of dopamine, D1 and D2 receptors. They are D1 to D5 receptors. Retina has high levels of these. And atropine increments dopamine release. So if there is dopamine release, there is more atropine, and that probably controls the axial length. 
now how we approach pre myopia that uh, more outdoor activities classroom lighting levels have to increase and less near work and parental myopia factor also has to be taken into account ac by air ratio axial length and peripheral deep refraction are poor markers for pre myopia now therapeutic options are you uh, this is there is a robust uh, experimental and clinical evidence regarding effect of dopamine uh, apomorphine on axial length of the eye uh, atom three studies underway to look into this uh, pre myopia aspect with atropine 0.01% and uh, devices employing myopic defocus are good, but they're not, uh, I mean, they might work in tandem with uh, atropine. Now, future questions, vision holding, what is pre-myopia? When to treat, age group, options, optimal dose, frequency and time of application, nightly or weekly, duration of treatment, up to what age, potential rebound phenomena, age of when to stop therapy, and mode of action of these agents. Now, CCDDs, we all know in 20 years, we have seen a lot of change in CCDDs as we understand them. And uh, this has happened mainly because of genetics and neuroimaging. There's a long list of CCDDs, as almost a dozen, and that list is expanding. Now, tubulins are very important when we think of CCDDs. These are uh, neurogenesis, neural migration, and neural differentiation are very crucial for CNS development. Microtubules are essential for these processes. So, microtubules compose of tubulin proteins. These are like a cytoskeleton in the uh, cell. And tubulins are a multi-gene family and have been implicated in diverse neurologic conditions. Tub 3 and Tub 2 are related to, they're important to us because they cause CCDDs like CFEUM. Now, there are certain CNS uh, problems we can have with TUB3 and TUB2 variants, like malformations of cortical development, degenerations of the corpus callosum, corticospinal tracts, basal ganglia, and hyperplasia of the oculomotor nerves. Could be microcephaly, microgyria, and polymicrogyria, and vocal cord paralysis. So, a lot of systemic uh, involvement we should keep in mind when we are talking of these CCDDs. Other things are kinesins and transcri uh, transcription factors. Kinesins contain three domains, motor, stalk, and tail. The motor interacts with the microtubule tract and walks down the microtubule. The stalk links the motor and tail domain, and tail carries the cargo. So they are very important for CNS, uh, I mean, uh, transmission along the neuromuscular uh, nerves. Transcription factors are proteins involved in converting DNA to RNA. So imaging, as we know, has done a lot of uh, you know, knowledge has been gained through imaging. There's gradient eco and turbo spin eco techniques. One third of uh, congenital third nerve palsies may show hypoplasia. Up to 70% of the fourth nerve palsies can show CN4 hypoplasia or SO hypoplasia. DRS, uh, you have type 1 absent, 6 nerve type 2 present, and type 3 may be variable presence. Mobius, you have CN6 and uh, seven nerve abnormal hypoplasia or abnormalities and CFM you have CN3 hypoplasia. Now genot uh, genetic studies, as we know in CFM there is uh, KIF21A which is uh, kinesin and then there is uh, PHOX2A which is a transcription factor and TUB2 and TUB3 variants. So there are the three main groups of uh, uh, things which are causing the CFMs. Pontine CCDDs, uh, genetics, as we all know, uh, DRS is very complex. You have CHN and sulfur is in DRSs and Okihoro syndrome. FOXA1 has ABDS and BSS and Robo3 is AGPPS. These are some cases uh, presenting in a very uh, complete, diverse way. I think I'll not be going into these uh, details. He had, like here, he was a third now palsy and you could there was a vestibule and nystagmus, as you can see, and there was synergistic divergence as he looks to the opposite side. When he looks up, so these look like third nerve palsies, but they have a lot of complex disinnervation. This is showing that the right eye is having intorsion, and when he looks up, the right eye goes for extorsion and the left eye goes for intorsion. What happens in a typical oculotilt reaction? 
So these had uh, involvement of autolithic pathways along with third nerve palsy and vestibular nystagmus. This is another one showing fourth nerve and Brown syndrome, fourth nerve palsy and Brown's on the, in the same patient, one side fourth nerve and other side Brown's. So these are also both CCDDs, classed as CCDDs. Some of MEDs are also classed as CCDDs as TUB3 and TUB2 variants. So when we look at CCD, uh, MEDs, those with IR fibrosis need to be looked from CCDD point of view. This is another complex presentation with microphthalmos and uh, cystic eyeball and type 3 CFM probably. So to conclude, I would just like to say what Socrates said, that I know that I don't know nothing. So we need to learn a lot about these conditions and their evolving entities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pandey. In spite of your very busy schedule, uh, you have completed your, time, your topic in time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I call Dr. Kokar. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Mike, Doctor. Uh, Doctor Pandey, you said that Kokar. pre. Sorry. No, go ahead. Pre myopia means from plus zero point seven five to minus zero point five diopters. If a child has. Yeah. So suppose, then would you prescribe spectacles? Because in your next slide, you mentioned that these children are spectacle free. So would you prescribe spectacles for these children or not? At that age group, they are they are not usually prescribed glasses because uh, once they get older, right, they are about, see, pre myopia we start treating by about five years to 12 years. So before that, there's emetropization which is going on till two years, anyway, eye is growing. So from 16.8, we go to about 23 in axial length, what you were talking. So from two years to six years, anyway, there is process of emetropization. But so suppose, stabilized by that. Point five, yeah. if you don't correct, it doesn't create much of a, it's not a, in a small child, minus point five is not a big deal. No, but if you have a child of say six, seven years or five years, who is symptomatic, who is having a headache, and he has this number only in one eye, will you prescribe? If it is in one eye, that case, uh, issues of an isometropy and all that, that needs to be looked at differently. But uh, classically, if it is bilateral situation, plus 0.75 to minus 0.5, usually better to postpone it and see how it is behaved. Because generally, the parents are of the opinion that why do we need to give the child spectacles at this age? They are hesitant. So we should be aware of what we are supposed to do. I think that will go into the conditions of prescribing glasses, those guidelines for prescribing glasses. Yeah. But I think in this pre myopic situation. But he uh, is pre myopic. Yeah, yeah. I have seen some of that. You said about the anomalies. Have you seen some cases of golden heart syndrome? Cases golden heart syndrome. Golden heart syndrome. Golden heart, yes, of course we have seen. Now, the thing is that 80 to 85 percent cases are normal from the visual and the medical point. 10 to 15 percent of the cases, there are additional granular anomalies. Again, the thing is that uh, the additional granular anomalies, they say that it is because of the incomplete de uh, development of the first and second brachial arch to detect the genes, or maternal diabetes, gestational diabetes mellitus, or because of exposure to the rubella toxoplasmosis. And or intentional or unintentional intake of thalidomide or drug acid. I've said about four or five cases of Golden Heart Syndrome. I've published this case, and uh, most of them luckily were in the group of 80 to 85 percent of the cases were they were normal, which had a congenital lipoderma, zero risk intact, but the other anomalies that they are like they have got the additional anomalies in the form of double ureter process, congenital heart defects in the dental anomalies, hearing defects. Then they have got uh, what is called as a fear of the mental faculty, sex outer is normal, unilateral aplasia of the set. Trigeminal anesthesia. There are 17 families of Gold Heart Syndrome in Greece. Yeah. Gold Heart Syndrome. Mithil et al. in 1968 reported three cases of optical bruises with. Yeah. Uh, sir, we have time for discussion at the end. So let's. Conditions, I think they have, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, presentation and uh, differences. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, next speaker is Dr. Sudarsh, Professor Sudarshan Khokar. Thank you. Should I? Yeah, he's okay, going to start you. talk on OCT guided pediatric cataract surgery. Right, thank you. He's one of the known legends in ophthalmology. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. So I was given a topic to uh, speak on IOCT. So why IOCT? Because all over the world, everything has started uh, based on technology. I'm a proponent of a good technique. I like to talk, discuss techniques, but sitting in a hospital, the other person buys the technology, he says, I'm superior because I could afford this one crore, five crore machine. So let's see how it helps you or not, because we, we acquired this machine, and this tool has been uh, used by the refractive surgeons, cataract surgeons. So let's see, does it have any anything to offer for the pediatric cataracts? Here we go. So what is the surgery as us now? What are we doing right now? According to technique, here, there's no technology here, just a technique. You make three port incision, like Kalpana showed the surgery. I think I'll run it faster because that'll save me some time towards the end. You do the ACC, do a PCC, and then you do a vitrectomy, a less goes into the bag, and that's what you want. So how is OCT going to help us in any of these steps during the surgery? So let's debate on this and find out. At the end, I'll give you a conclusion where I find it's useful, and most of the places it's not very useful, though. So it's a spectral domain OCT. It provides a high resolution uh, in vivo images and have been used by the cataract surgeon as well as the refractive surgeons. Okay. Now, the same technology has been got onto the microscope, and you can do the same thing per operative during the surgery, see, going from the, all the way from anterior cornea all the way going back to the retina. Okay. So corneal surgeries, it helps you the corneal, especially the DSAC, DLAX, you can actually see the images. If you're doing a smile patient, in case there's a lenticule not visible, put the patient on the, on the OCT and you'll be able to pick up the, uh, the lamella very clearly. Okay, so where, are, it's, where it's going to be useful, it's basically more of a, a tool right now which is experimental and you can use it for certain things. We're trying to put some data together. Maybe next time we meet, I'll be able to discuss that in more details. So you can actually see the lens. You can see the morphology of the cataract, different kind of congenital cataract morphologies, and you can actually have a typical pictures which we are trying to find out which can be seen on, on the OCT in these patients. Interlenticular changes I talked about, you can have an opacification of the anterior capsule or posterior capsule. So most of these capsules which we feel is a thin single layer is not so. When you do the OCT, you realize there are multiple layers sometimes, and some layers in the in front of the capsules and some behind the capsules. So this is the other thing which we are looking into and we're able to find out. All these membranes are much clearer than what you can see on slit lamp or a naked eye, but the OCT is able to pick it up. You can work around the Burgess space. I'll show you some videos about the Burgess space, how you can actually define the Burgess space and find out how it's opening. And uh, Mary Sessigan doing uh, lots of work on the Burgess space. And of course, the wound construction can be seen. Okay, so this is video number one in which you can actually see the cataract. You can see the morphology up here. So this is not a typical zonular lamellar because you can see this, there's a little more uh, translucency in the periphery and the central part is much denser. Whereas the lamellas normally have a, a consistency all around. You can have a central lamella, central nuclear also, but this was the different thing. So that you can pick up on that one. So along with the surgery when it's going on, you can pick up and you can see there's a membrane at the back, which is seen right now here, and that you can see the reflection on the back. So no big deal, you can see it otherwise also. So what happens when you break this membrane and try to see what's behind? You, sh you expect a hyaloid layer, but in this patient, it has multiple layers. It had two, three layers, and one was hyaloid layer, and one more layer was in between. We don't know what the layer is there for, but we could pick up just because the OCT was there with us. And I'll just run this video fast. The timer is, timer is not running there. OK, so I have to look all the way up there. OK, I got four minutes. OK, fine. I don't want to listen to the bell. It's quite a harsh bell, so I'll finish before the bell rings. OK. OK, so see, I've got this plaque up, and the capsule was not open and then once you open the capsule we do the vitrectomy you can see the opening and now you can make out the layers quite clearly so this was a patient in which the membrane at the back and the posterior membrane was not one layer it was multiple layers and that we could pick up and manage it so in case of in cases of a patient where you don't want to do a vitrectomy and you leave the posterior lamella layer intact there's more chance of VO formation in these patients but if you're doing a vitrectomy, it doesn't help you much because in that case, you whatever layer is at the back, you're going to eat it up anyway. And that's towards the end of the surgery, the lens goes into the bag. And you can actually ensure that both the flaps are in the front of the anterior capsule and posterior capsule at the back up here. All right, so let's skip to the next one. Okay. Here we go. So this one I've started after the anterior excess has been done. I'm going to be making a nick at the posterior capsule. So when we started doing these surgeries, at that time, the dictum was that you make a nick on the posterior capsule and put a helon 
behind the posterior neck so that it goes and pushes the highlight back. So we stopped using that technique. What we do is now we put in a needle on the posterior capsule and, and scratch it through, and it breaks the posterior capsule without disturbing the hyaloid. So this was a technique which I used earlier. So I thought I'll just try to replicate that on, on, on the OCT. So if you notice here, once I put in the viscoelastic, the posterior capsule actually has come all the way up. It's all raised all the way up. Now it's actually looking like anterior capsule. Even worse than that, because it's much thinner and much anterior, and the posterior part is all full, full of viscoelastic. And we, we did a rexis in this one, and I realized that rexis was not as easy to perform once I had filled up the entire burger space. So if you want to do this technique, please ensure that you don't put too much viscoelastic, because I just realized the viscoelastic was too much, and the anterior posterior capsule was coming almost in, at the level of the anterior capsule. It was getting so pushed up. So once the rexis were done, you went ahead and did the surgery. So this was a thing which was uh, in my mind for quite many years that which is a better technique. So I can say that if you want to open the budget space, please don't overfill it, underfill it, and you can get away. Or you avoid going there at all, totally. Even you can do a rexis forceps with, pick up the rexis forceps and do it. I got two minutes, 10 seconds gone. OK. All right, so when the surgery is over, you can make out the lens again in position, and everything looks good here. OK. now. OK, the, the one more thing in this patient which I wanted to talk about. OK, now what you see here, now this was the other eye of the same patient. It's in the same video, though. So first, I did this. I'm doing the second eye, which I showed you, making a Burgess space up. Now this was the eye which I've done three days back. And you can pick up some changes on the interior capsule. So if you pick up a, uh, uh, this was a, basically a reaction kind of thing which was there. So we gave an injection in that eye also, which was not visible to the naked eye and the child was not showing. So once you patient, you have OCT, you can just switch over to the other side with a dilated pupil. And if you find this kind of thing, we gave an injection immediately there on the table and the next day it all cleared up. So it can actually tell you if the view has formation has started that as soon, it's not possible to have it within 24, 48 hours. So this was actually a reaction which settled down. So that was another tool which you can use to pick up in these patients. So that's why I wanted to show this. And that's the last one, and there are different unique scenarios. So that's the plaque on the back. I've already removed the anterior capsule. That's the plaque in the posterior capsule, all the way big. So we give a nick and try to go behind it. And this was being cut by the, you can't do a excess there. So I put in a MVR cut right in the middle and then because there's a membrane at the back, I want to cut it all the way. You can put some visco behind it, and then you can actually cut it. So you can, grazing the thickness of the membrane on the OCT, you can either use a blade, or you can use a rexus forcep, or you can just peel it off. So that actually gives you an idea. So this was case number two, in which, again, we uh, there's a membrane at the back, and we made an opening and pushed it, put, put a helon behind it. So you can see it's uh, bulging up there. And we could do it, the rexus in this one. And since it was a small bulge, we could just localize in the center, 3, 3.5, we could actually do the rexis. And you see in these patients, when you're doing the rexis, it's getting stretched all the way out, which was not visible to the naked eye otherwise, and you can see it on the IOCT if you have it. And then anterior vitrectomy, once it's done, the, the flaps fall back, and the entire posterior capsule again becomes, uh, the curvature is maintained. Okay. OK, now this was one of the patients in which both the capsule of fuse and on the OCT, we could find on the, both the capsule of fuse anterior posterior, so we, could, we were able to put the lens in, in the sulcus with a three piece. Uh, 30 seconds more, I think this is almost over. Now that's a patient with a persistent fetal vasculature, and there's a membrane with a vascularity there, which was very well picked up on this. And just conclude, sir. Time is over. No, I'm just done. All right, so here also you can see the multiple modality. You can see the thickness of the thing at the back. And once you cut it, so it actually gives you the thickness, a real-time thickness OCT, and tells you that you can actually use whatever technique you want. You can use a cutter, or you can use a diathermy in this patient in case you have a blood vessels on the top, and you can get away. And if it's a softer one, you can just aspirate it, or you can polish it off with, with, the, with your biomineral candle itself. Right. Thank you. With that, I'll close the speech, and I'm open for any discussions or questions. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Manju Bhatte. Yeah, Dr. Bhatte uh, heads the pediatric department at LV Prasada Institute. We have five speakers and it's eight minutes per speaker. So I would uh, request them to please keep that time. Perfect. Thank you so much.
Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank the organizers at AIOC for uh, inviting to me to speak in the National Symposium. So I'm going to take you all through some rare eye diseases and an ocular genetics update. So as we know, pediatric ophthalmology deals with varied syndromic, genetic, and inherited conditions. And genetic testing aids in obtaining a confirmatory diagnosis. We now belong to the genomics era, so ocular genetics has gained foothold with advances in gene therapy, especially conditions like inherited retinal disorders or the RP65 uh, LCA. So appropriate genetic counseling is crucial for families. Let's go through some of the cases of rare eye diseases and update on some of these conditions. So the first case is this two-year-old child called Kirti. She hailed from Northeast India and was referred for bilateral corneal opacities. Um, she was also diagnosed elsewhere with global developmental delay, facial dysmorphism, hypotonia, I had non-consanguinous parents. So as we can see <clears throat> in this slide over here, uh, there is a progeroid appearance, so she had very loose um, and uh, loose skin, uh, sparse hair, wrinkled skin. This is like a two-year-old. It looks like an old man's photo or, or old uh, woman's photo. Um, so also there were other features that we can see uh, which are highlighted here. Uh, in addition, the patient had congenital dislocation of hips uh, for which she was given a hip brace, had malformed teeth, posteriorly rotated ears. So what I'm just trying to draw your attention to is we also need to look beyond the eyes for all these extra uh, features that we are able to um, uh, sort of pick up. And these pinealtal corneal opacities. So we heard in these cases, we think of something like an Ehlers-Danlos or a cocaine syndrome. So these are the extraocular features that the child had. She had adducted thumbs, pectus excavatum, uh, hyperextensible joints, hip dislocation. And uh, with the genetic testing, we were able to confirm. So this was also done for the parents. And we were able to confirm a PYCR1 gene, which is um, uh, confirmatory for a progeroid syndrome of DBRC or DBRC syndrome which is called as the autosomal recessive type 3 cutis laxa. Uh, so from the ocular point of view, she underwent corneal transplantation sequentially, one eye after the other, had clear graphs, improved vision, and amblyopia treatment. Uh, we also managed to publish this in ophthalmic genetics because it's something really rare. Our next rare eye disease is a child. Um, I try and run this photo if you can look at the ocular motility over here. So see what happens when we're trying to um, uh, check for abduction. Both eyes tend to converge, so there's a synergistic convergence. There is absolutely no abduction in either eye, both the right as well as the left eye. <clears throat> so this is the ninth position of gaze where there is no abduction. Um, and uh, on primary position, there was a 35 to 40 prism diopters of esotropia on Krimsky test. Um, so this child also underwent nystagmography and an MRI, where on the MRI we can see this butterfly-shaped medulla, which is confirmatory of a horizontal gaze palsy and progressive sco scoliosis, that is the HGPPS. And further, the child underwent genetic testing to confirm a robo-3 mutation. What's important in this child was that she did not have the scoliosis. And we've seen a series of about four or five patients who presented to our institute. Uh, all of these present with the scoliosis much later in life. So it's mainly the horizontal gaze that comes on first, and they all need systemic evaluation. They all need a genetic testing to be able to prove what exactly is the uh, confirmatory diagnosis, and they need a multidisciplinary approach, so they need to be evaluated by the spine a surgeon at regular intervals. So this was her post-medial uh, rectus recession where she was um, fairly orthotropic and has a regular follow-up with ophthalmology as well as the orthopedic team. Our next rare eye disease is these two siblings. So as you can see, they definitely look syndromic. They have a large skull. They have a hypertilorism. And uh, this boy has extreme ptosis. And both of them present with a very large exotropia. So they had minus four um, <clears throat> limitation of elevation, adduction, and depression. Uh, this extra large exotropia, as you can see, and uh, looks more something like a, probably a variant of CFEOM or a CCDD. Um, in addition, the boy had the ptosis, so I'm going to try and run this video of this little girl where you can see the, um, other than the ocular, also the child had a lot of skeletal uh, abnormalities, malformed ears as well. So there's limitation of motility in almost all positions. 
they can run just a little faster and see these real tiny ears that both of them had. Both are extremely short and have dwarfism as well. Um, so they were um, diagnosed with a TBX15 um, gene, which is um, a homozygous for cousin syndrome. And the parents are also being tested currently uh, for segregation analysis to confirm the deletion. So, uh, so the child had surgery for his exotropia as well as a tosafrontal sling to try and clear the pupillary axis uh, because of the poor bells and they're still under care for uh, further evaluation. After the rare eye diseases, let's move to something which we see very commonly in our clinics, that is albinism, which is a reduced uh, or a reduction of the amount of melanin, and it can be either oculocutaneous, which is, which is autosomal recessive, or ocular albinism, which is X-linked <coughs> inheritance. And albinism, as we so see, exists in all species, right, from the birds, animal kingdom, as well as in humans. And these are some children who presented with different abnormal head postures and have albinism uh, and have uh, nystagmus, which drives the abnormal head posture. This is one young boy called Raghavan who actually had painted, uh, colored his hair orange. And I kept thinking, oh, he's some orange variant of albinism, which is uh, later on when they <laughs> mentioned to me that they have used this uh, hair color. But as we can see, he's got the typical nystagmus, the abnormal head posture, refractive error. He, the, the picture on the, uh, on the right showing his arms actually was just to check whether he had any bruising or he was fitting into a hermansky pudlak uh, syndrome, which clinically at least he did not. And what I would, so again, he, uh, this is the same child who's got all the features of iris trans illumination, a blonde fundus, <coughs> foveal hypoplasia. And what I would like to draw your, our attention is that there's a lot of phenotypic variation in these OCA or any sort of uh, albinism uh, patients. And we tried to do a study to look at their variations with regards to strabismus, refractive errors, abnormal head posture, as well as their vision and rehabilitative services that may be required just to try and give families an idea that if you have one albinotic child, the other child may not be that severely or may be more severely affected. So some of the recent advances that we have is the FDA-approved inhibitor of tyrosine degradation or l dopa supplementation, which has been tried in albinism. Also, the adeno-associated viral vector. So this was just one area that I wanted to cover in this short span of eight minutes. But gene therapy has had a lot of uh, advances in these recent years and in the years to come. So I think it's really important that we consider a gen uh, genotypic diagnosis for all our patients so that we can give them the best possible care. Um, as I said, it's the benchmark for diagnosis and management of most patients with congenital and inherited conditions. Uh, there have been advances in ocular genetics in certain areas with more trials underway. So an interdisciplinary approach and teamwork is crucial in managing these cases. Thank you so much for your patient listening. It's my favorite peacock. That's an albinotic peacock, yes. <laughs> have you seen uh, how many cases of blepharophimosis syndrome have you seen? Sorry? Blepharophimosis syndrome. Blepharophimosis syndrome. Um, well, we, I would say maybe one in two, three months of blepharophimosis syndrome. It, it's because it's a tertiary referral hospital, we do tend to see quite a few, yes. Uh, no, so that would uh, involve a number of surgeries, so it will involve not... Yes? Uh, due to paucity of time, I think we can have question answers later on. I'll request the next speaker. I'll, I'll get back to you on this. Thank you. Dr. Elizabeth Joseph. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, th I, th I would like to thank the organizers for including me in this national symposium on pediatric ophthalmology. I'm talking on current concepts in the management of small deviations, like uh, mini tenotomy, partial tenotomy, mini plication, etc. Uh, see, small angle deviation refers to deviations less than 10 prism diopters. 
Uh, Non-surgical management with prisms, Botox, etc. are there, but there are some surgical procedures also to take care of small deviations like partial tenotomy, mini tenotomy, mini plication, etc. Mini tenotomy is a minimally invasive surgical technique that weakens the rectus muscle to produce a correction of about 4 to 8 prism diopters. It's an alternative to wearing prism glasses developed by Kenneth Wright. So this is the uh, diagrammatic representation of um, mini tenotomy. The central 2 to 3 millimeters of the rectus muscle is cut off. Uh, so indication for mini tenotomy is also a very small uh, deviation or a, a residual deviation after standard surgical procedure. In cases of sensory microstrabismus and macular diplopia following a, an epiretral membrane correction, uh, this is a very good option. Remember that in vertical uh, squints, fusion amplitude is very uh, small and uh, small vertical deviations can result in uh, double vision and asthenopic symptoms. So this, uh, this uh, surgery is of use there. Uh, I, nowadays, we see a lot of um, uh, macular diplopia due to epiretral membrane, membrane peeling, and in such conditions, a central mini tenotomy is very effective. See, this patient has got a small left hypertropia, and because of this, this is an engineering student. She, he finds difficulty in looking at the, uh, uh, listening to the professors because on looking up, there is a hypertropia. In such patients, we can do um, uh, mini tenotomy on the uh, vertical recti, that's the uh, superior rectus. And this uh, procedure is um, done under uh, topical anesthesia and can be done as an outpatient procedure and uh, the important thing is you have to identify the uh, superior rectus muscle. With the forceps, you get hold of the uh, rectus muscle and pull on the rectus muscle so that you make sure that the entire muscle is in your forceps and not the fascia alone. And after uh, you make sure that the muscle is in your hand, you can do a small uh, uh, mini tenotomy by cutting uh, the portion of the muscle between the forceps and the sclera. This is done transconjunctively. You don't have to, uh, to expose the conjunctiva. And after making a such, such a cut, you just uh, uh, see the area, make sure that the two pillars of the muscle at the either end is remaining there and uh, uh, the central area of the muscle is retracted. And at this point of time, uh, uh, you, you can now see the two pillars of the uh, two uh, muscle uh, on, on either side and a central area where the muscle has retracted. Now we go ahead, do the cover test, see whether the uh, correction is adequate. And if the correction is not adequate, come back and do a few more snips. and. Uh, there is no need of any suturing. And now come to the partial tenotomy. This is usually done in mild horizontal strabismus, especially those cases in which there is a primary position orthotropia and up and down gaze, there is a small deviation. These patients will present with asthenopic symptoms. This is the diagrammatic representation of pa partial tenotomy popularized by Alan Scott. Again, um, I'll show you the uh, surgical video in partial uh, uh, partial tenotomy. Uh, again, can be done under topical anesthesia. You identify the uh, muscle. Uh, I'll just uh, and after identifying the muscle, uh, you can uh, cut. You can make a small cut like that. And after making a cut close to the uh, insertion. Uh, again, go ahead, do the cover test. If there is any undercorrection, you, you can cut a little more of the muscle. Up to 90% can be cut. This can be done in both the eyes. In, uh, I'll show you uh, the picture. This is a child who presented with a primary position orthotropia, but on down gaze, there is a, an exo. And because of that, the child had asthenopic symptoms on reading. The, the, the child was not able to concentrate on re, uh, reading books and uh, was not doing well in uh, school. So we did a partial tenotomy. Um, and uh, post-operative picture, you can see that there is no overcorrection, no undercorrection. It's a, an optimum correction is possible. And um, so in mild to moderate AV pattern with straight or almost straight eyes in the primary position and a deviation in up or down gaze, you can do a partial tenotomy. And uh, the, a few strengthening surgeries also are there. 
uh, to correct small deviation. This is mini plication in which uh, small conjunctival incision is made over the muscle. The muscle is grafted and a uh, suture is put just like you see in the picture and then the suture is advanced to in front of the muscle onto the sclera and it is tightened to produce mini plication. Similarly, there is a uh, mini angled resection also just like uh, what you see in this uh, uh, photograph. Uh, a suture is passed from the center of the insertion to 5 millimeters behind uh, and the triangular area is excised and the suture is advanced and uh, uh, brought forward and uh, this is also published. Uh, and I would like to conclude saying that management of small angle strabismus is very challenging and these patients may have significant asthenopic symptoms and diplopia and conventional procedures often lead to overcorrection and such new uh, several procedures are now available and this can be done, done under topical anesthesia and this is an alternative to prisms. All these patients can be treated with prisms but the difficulty is that they have to have a lifelong uh, spectacle wear. So those people who are wear, already wearing spectacles, you can give prisms. Those people who are not wearing spectacles, um, uh, this is a very good option. With that, I conclude my talk. Thank you, AAOC. Thank you for patient hearing. Thank you, ma'am, for excellent talk. Now I invite Dr. Pradeep Desh Pandey. Dr. Desh Pandey will be speaking on Amlaivia Therapy Vision 2020. Good morning, everybody. This is the topic is Amblyopia management, thinking beyond vision 2020. Everybody will think that what is, is it possible? What you are talking something different? Yes, I am going to add few important points from literature also and from my experience also. A strategy to achieve high level and stable vision. Is there is a commonest observation with everybody that the vision, there, there is a lot of regression of vision more than, in, even, even in more than 25% cases. So in such cases, what we should do? A strategy to achieve high level and stable vision in a short period. That too, at home, in a user-friendly, in, interesting way, with good compliance. Well, our precious, meritorious 2 to 5 percent new generation may be thrown out of competition from class 1 jobs with a level of visually unfit due to amblyopia. Over 100 years, in spite of trying different treatment regimes, amblyopia management remains confused, unsolved, having a prevalence of 1.5 to 3.9 in developed nations like US and more than 8 percent in 8% in underprepared population. Yes, what are the recent advances? Um, previously, it was what we learned that amblyopia has been defined as a unilateral or sometimes bilateral reduction in the best corrected visual acuity. But as per the recent advances, amblyopia is a binocular dysfunction, binocular disorder. In fact, the major mechanism is not only the lazy state of the one eye, but the active inhibition of the amblyopic eye by the dominant eye, which disrupts the equilibrium between the excitatory and the inhibitory signals. You can see that picture of twin babies. And it needs to treat binocularly. There are more than 100 researchers. They, are, they have published different papers for binocular management including Dr. Um, sorry. Yes. Now I'd like to tell you something different. There is a complementary faster route to achieve the high level and stable vision by playing specific video games enhances the improvement of recognition of like recognition of contrast objects and stereo vision 
these are the different researchers from USA, Israel, and the definition of amblyopia again there is a it is a sort of syndrome it is not a one thing that only the visual acuity is important there are many more things which are important in the vision of amblyopia there are contrast recognition of contrast sensitivity depth perception stereoscopy the crowding phenomena and there are so many things are involved in that and if you try to correct all these things then only the vision will be of high level and good quality. You can see this color, color, color contrast game where the same color is divided into 100%, 60%, 30%. The child has to select that particular color when the wheel is rotating and you can score good marks and practice makes him perfect like that the vision improves that the contrast also improves. In astigmatic children where the, there is a mineral amblyopia, here this is one of my paper in IJO where I stimulate the exact lesimidians, lesimidian neurons and we can improve the vision very nicely. Then this is a book on amblyopia. This is a home base, user friendly, simple, interesting solutions. Lazy eye master, general, rainbow, astronomy axis, and specific function games are will be available very soon to be played on 10 inches tab, patented tab. The tab got patented for assessment and improvement of visual activities. The entire system, of course, with the instruct the restriction of screen time. Thank you very much. Kindly attend the midterm, next midterm conference at Aurangabad on 24th and 25th June. It's a golden opportunity to have one-to-one -one interaction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Deshpande, sir. Uh, sir is the president of SPOSI. And sir, thank you for finishing before time. So we have now Professor Rohit Saxena from the All India Institute a very well-known researcher in myopia control. Thank you, uh, Dr. Parekshit, for giving me the opportunity to be here uh, in this uh, wonderful, very august national symposium. Uh, I'll be quickly trying to run through whatever little we understand now about uh, uh, management of progressive myopia in children. Uh, just the brief background we all know uh, after this uh, Brian Holden study that uh, there is a possible uh, projection of myopia to be affecting almost 50% of the uh, world's population by 2050. There was very little data from India which they incorporated in their study. So we did this uh, uh, systematic review and meta-analysis of all Indian data over four decades. And we actually came out with very, very surprising things for us also. The, although the overall crude prevalence was 7.5% in, over the last four decades, uh, it has reached almost 15% in the last decade for 11 to 15 years. So we know that we are significantly increasing in the percentage of children with myopia. And the other startling thing was that in the last decade, we have seen a huge increase in rural myopia from 4.6% in the previous decade to 6.8% in this decade. And all this data which we compiled was pre-COVID. So we know that uh, we are actually staring for this, for this problem in India also. Now, when do we intervene? So what is, what is the approach we're going to have? When are we wanting to intervene? Most important is identify the child with risk factors. So myopic ref significant myopic refractive error, although now we have revised to 0.05, but definitely established myopia. Uh, age, genetics, and visual environment consideration. So that's something we need to know about each child. And of course, the genetic background uh, with the parental and the sibling myopia. Document myopic progression. This is something I feel very strongly about, irrespective of the start or the first time glasses when the child has come to you, irrespective of that, document myopic progression 
0.5 diopters a year is usually the threshold to start treatment. It's not necessary if you are, if the child has moderate myopia and you are worried that he is progressing rapidly, you can just follow him up at six months and try and extrapolate that for a year. But please document progression. It has a very important uh, management aspect also. And then of course, uh, understanding the background about the child, when he, uh, his, uh, when did he need glasses, how, my, how frequently has he had to change, any other eye complaints, and general, of course, the background about the child. Communicate and educate. It's, I, it's, I think, uh, essential on our part to actually uh, transfer this uh, information that we have and the anxiety we have about the next generation becoming myopic to the parents, the guardians, the teachers, anybody associated with childcare. Discuss the treatment options because there are many now, the efficacy, the risks, and of course, the benefits that they are expected from that. Take an informed consent for some of the off-label in interventions that you're going to do. Remember, while the lenses are available in India, they are not separately approved in India. Uh, only the drugs uh, that is atropine and that too at 0.01% is approved from DCGI. Perform baseline examinations, importantly biometry, and then start treatment and follow up accordingly. Treatment should incorporate the understanding, their understanding of risks, benefits, their lifestyle, economic status, and the co compliance. We have a lot of options now, the optical interventions, including spectacles and contact lenses, uh, the optical, pharm the pharmacological, essentially being atropine, although they are available at different doses, you can uh, compound them at your own pharmacy or get them compounded locally. There are a couple of molecules that have found to be of interest and have been tried, although they are yet to be as effective or uh, compared to atropine. And of course, the sheet anchor, I think, of our intervention, which is to eliminate the risk factors that are there, which is in the form of lifestyle modification. I personally say that to every patient, and I mean, as, as ophthalmologists, I feel that we must talk about myopia being the youngest lifestyle disease. It is a lifestyle disease because over the last 30 to 40 years, we have seen a jump from a, a mean of 20% world over to almost 40% now in our young population. And genetics obviously has not changed. The lifestyle we know have. So we need to get the focus onto lifestyle and therefore it's important to remember lifestyle modifications by increasing outdoor time, reducing near work, increase ambient illumination indoors also, makes a huge impact of course all the other uh, eye health conditions that we advise them. Atropine is the most clinically accepted and studied drug. It is highly affordable with ease of availability and administration. We have a proven drug dependent effect on them although we are still not sure how it acts, but it is known to be significantly affected across all uh, ethnic groups. Uh, the other alternative that has now come in uh, has been available in the West for some time, now available for almost a year in India are these uh, defocus induced uh, multiple segments or the dim spectacles, these are by Hoya, but the basic principle remains the same. They provide a myopic defocus on the peripheral retina because basically on the concept that while we are, when our single focus glasses, while they are well focused on the macula, in the periphery, this, uh, they are providing a hyperopic defocus, which is causing or stimulating the axial elongation. And based on that concept, they have these small, 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 small lens sets in the periphery, which provide for a myopic defocus, which is supposed to act and prevent myopic elongation. While a lot of talk is going on about having peripheral refraction, but essentially they've been proven to work in all kinds of uh, peripheral refractive errors. So uh, in fact, recently my, uh, uh, Hoya came out with their six, six year results, uh, which appear to be uh, fairly good. Uh, of course, there's lack of this information in India at the moment and its effect in India. The alternatives are the HALT lenses, again, similar uh, concept, uh, but by Essilor. Uh, uh, another set are, of course, by Zeiss. They also have the added plus lenses for near vision for children with accommodative lag. And while some time back we never used to think that myopes and children are ever going to have an accommodative related problem, but there is increasing evidence that some group of this has an accommodative issue and therefore it's very, very important to identify these children and probably treat them separately. Many of them may require these near ads along with basin prisms. So these are available and in 
this small subgroup of children they have found to be fairly effective. Orthokeratology is the other alternative, uh, not very popular I, I feel in India and we don't have too much experience on them. They work by temporarily reshaping and flattening the center of the cornea. It also brings about some changes on the epith epithelium, therefore this effect is, effect is considered to last much longer. There is a rebound probably because once you stop using them, again the epithelium reshapes itself and the myopia does tend to come back. And of course, it's an overnight wear contact lenses with a lot of risks in at least the Indian uh, setting, so it's not been popular. Soft multifocal contact lenses were in fact the first approved uh, treatment modality available in India, especially as daily disposables to reduce the risk. Uh, again, proven to be fairly effective, as I said, the first FDA approved for myopia control. But again, we come back to lifestyle and environmental modifications, almost 120 minutes of outdoor activity during amb high or moderate ambient light. So that is the important intervention along with reduction of new work wherever possible. This is just a table showing the uh, known effects of uh, summation of the known effects by various studies and atropine continues to be fairly significant but I've put increased outdoor activity right on top. This can affect and help and act in each and every of the child and act as a complement to all the other alternative modalities. So look for myopia progression, uh, do particularly axial length because that is important, stop treatment or switch if it is not effective and you may need to supplement it if it is partially effective. Important to community-based uh, interventions and discuss with people and to conclude, analyze the risk factor profile, decide the treatment, educate and communicate do baseline examination and follow up the patient based on your uh, plan. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, that was a very wonderful presentation, sir. Very, very comprehensive. Now we have Dr. Sumita Agarkar, uh, the head of pediatric ophthalmology at Sankara Netrale. They have done a lot of work on the public health aspect of myopia along with the REACH program. So we would love to hear from you, ma'am. Uh, how many of you are involved in some kind of school screening? Just a show of hands. One, two, three, four. Okay. So I think for a pediatric ophthalmologist to be involved in a school screening program is also a part of our social responsibility. And uh, I, I think we all should do it, even at a very small level, or just do one school or whatever, but it's important. So what is the evidence arranging? What, what we do know is that it is the la second largest program following cataract surgery of national uh, NPCB. It is, again, refractive errors is most important cause of visual impairment among children. And visual impairment can have a deep impact on their education and their ability to uh, interact with their peers and participate meaningfully in their day-to-day act day activities. Now, what is the information which is coming out of school screening programs? It tells you about prevalence of IDCs among children. It tells you effectivity of service delivery. It tells you, it al allows you to analyze the cost burden of these uh, running the school program. And also, to a lesser extent, not yet fully understood, but we also have some initial uh, idea about impact of COVID uh, on, on school screening programs. Now, school screening programs are not the best way to look at the prevalence of IDCs because it's expensive. Population-based surveys are more effective, but they are expensive. And uh, there is only, in last 10 years, there is only one uh, available population survey, which was again in 2013-14 in the two districts of Pavagar and Madhu Madhugiri in Karnataka. And uh, Vasudha, uh, who did this uh, did this survey, they reported an ocular morbidity prevalence of 6.54% among uh, rural, partly rural, rural and taluk level children, and refractive errors was 2.7. Uh, blindness was considered 0 0.09. Uh, earlier survey of the same area in 2009, they found the blindness was almost same. 0.08%, uh, which is a little surprising and little also uh, reflection on our uh, health services. Now, of the recent thing, we uh, I'm going to talk about this project, REACH project, which was uh, directed by Orbis International. It was a multicentric ambitious project, which 
aimed at screening school children for refractive errors. This was done at six locations in India, targeting mostly rural and children who were studying in government funded schools. So total screens which were, sco uh, which were screened by uh, was around more than 10,000 and more than 2 million children were screened um, and spectacles and services were provided free of cost in this program. And if you see, there was a 8.63% uh, were referred because of the failed primary screening. 78% of those who attended secondary screening required spectacles as well as hospital referral. Uh, now, important thing again here, when you do rural children, if you see this number, that 27,621 children were referred to base hospital for services, but only 4,276 actually reached where they were supposed to go because of a variety of reasons. If you look at the spectacle compliance, which is in the REACH project, it provided some insight into how much was the spectacle in the adherence. So compliance to spectacle at follow at say median 5.61 for 66%, which is way better than what has been reported previously at 29%, because this project actually had a lot of inbuilt thing to improve compliance also in, in terms of compliance visit, as well as a lot of educational material. And again, this study found that compliance was better. This is a little unpublished data as far as REACH is concerned, but compliance was better in patients who presented with poorer visual acuity, no surprises there, who were younger, who attended rural schools, and who were the first time spectacle wearers, and also those who lived in areas with low human development index. Now, why this data is important? Because it was representative of almost all regions. If you look at the six locations, it uh, it has both rural as well as, urban. it was mostly rural children, but screening strategy was uniform. It, it, uh, this uh, program provided for uh, children to choose their lenses. Sample size was very large. Emphasis on spectacle compliance was inbuilt in this project. And also, it clearly shows that greater need for free spectacle lies in poorer areas. If you look at the spectacle, if you look at the project sites, you can see there are some which are very poorly developed states like uh, this. Uh, and um, West Bengal to a certain extent, and there were also two states which are very high on human development index, but, and that also showed the data or economic divide between the schools in various parts of country. Are urban schools different? Yes, growing evidence in school screening uh, data which is coming out from schools in cities is there, it is almost double that of, uh, that of what has been reported in uh, say two decades back. So uh, systemic review, as Dr. Rohit mentioned, children under 15 was 8 percent, and there was a but there was a big urban rural divide in I mean in urban children it was close to 18.7 percent compared to 4.8 percent in uh, rural children. Uh, when we look only at urban children in North India, it is around 13.1 percent. Uh, Shankar Netralaya data, which is which is a prospective longitudinal study pegged it at 17.5%. And they also looked at not only just refraction, but also biometry. And STEM also found that prevalence was much higher in urban children compared to even suburban children. So there is a clear divide between uh, poor children and uh, poor children and also between rural and urban children. So urban schools also, uh, this study also throws up some amount of risk factors why urban schools it is increasing. Increasing age is a risk, risk factor across all studies. Gender has some mixed evidence. Some field girls uh, like Dr. Rohit Saxena's study proved that girls are probably a little more at risk for developing myopia, but other studies do not show the same, same, dip, same kind of, uh, it's a little mixed evidence here. Activities like studying for more than five hours, video game playing also affected the prevalence. And again, that also kind of explains why there was a little bit of rural urban divide. Myopia was significantly lower in children who played for more than two hours. And there is evidence to believe that outdoor activities have a protective influence. High myopia again has increasing and it was reported almost 1.5% in NIMS study and STEM reported it as three, which is two studies coming out from North India versus South India. Again, high, high myopia seems to be more in the Southern India. 
again it's not just about refractive errors we also looked at there are at least two studies which have been published in last 10 years which looked at non strabismic binocular vision abnormality anomalies these anomalies are often underrepresented and uh, this uh, rizwana husainuddin et al reported a prevalence of anomalies to be almost 31.5% in urban schools and 29% of rural children convergence insufficiency was the maximum followed by accommodative infertility among all the visual binocular vision anomalies which were seen there was no gender predilection for binocular vision anomalies but older children had definitely more prevalence uh, as i said cost burden school screening is an crucial strategy and economic burden of screening program has to be factored in when you run these programs so servan and tall have re- have uh, analyzed the cost of screening school models using a model which uses optometrist rather than a vision technician and analysis which included 65000 children enrolled in 295 schools the median cost of school screening per school was just about 29.65 dollars and cro- cost of screening was dependent mostly on school strength and sc- uh, screening team but loss of productivity which it pro- was almost like this big figure of 33970 dollars and screening model which used primary care model which used vision technicians and other technicians was even cheaper than even 29 dollars so let's address the elephant in the room the in fact impact of covid and this was the responsible for lot of things and do we have some data over over uh, oh, so there is only one study which looked at the impact of covid full uh, krishnamurthy et al have reported from their data of screening around 4000 children say between october 21 between the ages of four, 14 and 17 and prevalence of myopia was pegged at 19.5 which is looking at the same population which they had recorded around 17% in 2000 Uh, 16 to 18 so there is almost a 3 to 4 fold increase in previously reported prevalence in a similar cohort and this is only one study which has come out so this is the carry home prevalence is increasing covid has had a big impact but data is still out there outdoor activities clearly have a protective effect age of the child and access to digital devices probably has a negative impact school screening programs are very cost effective and beneficial and providing free spectacles to at least rural children and those with large magnitude of errors and who have never owned spectacles provide improves compliance to the glasses thank you very much and thank, thank you. you on behalf of all this this first session i am very much thankful to all our speakers all our panelists and especially professor subhar dedia as the chairperson and uh, the most important name is that parikshit gokte who has taken lot of pains to arrange this particular program continuously he was after everybody to arrange this program i am very much thankful to him and the audience too they have taken lot of interest if you have any time uh no i think we can take questions at outside the hall because uh, we have to hand this hall at 12 o'clock so we have to finish this at 12 o'clock so thank you thanks a lot for attending i would request all the speakers and panelists to stay for a quick photograph